So the next group of animals we're going to be looking at are the reptiles. What makes the reptiles distinct from the other tetrapods? Uh, so far we've looked at amphibians, which are the first tetrapods. The amniote lineage is that group of organisms that are connected by what we know as the amniotic egg. So this is a group of amphibian ancestors that eventually gave rise to first the reptiles, later the birds, and then eventually the mammals. Uh, so we need to go into a little bit of detail about this amniote egg. So we're going to watch a short video looking at the amniotic, amniotic egg. Walruses, rats, All right, so some questions that go along with that video. Uh, the amniotic egg evolved how long ago? About 350 million years ago, we think is the origin of this new kind of egg. 
Why is the amniotic egg considered a key evolutionary innovation? It allows for a completely terrestrial life. So organisms now are able to move not just like amphibians and spend part of their time on land, but they are able to spend their entire life on land. Why is the amniotic egg compared to a traveling pond? Well, we know that from amphibians that having a pond, having a water source nearby is critical for reproduction. And having an amniotic egg means that you're, have a, you have a shell that encloses that aquatic environment and carries it around with you. So it's like bringing your pond with your egg. The chorion of the amniotic egg functions in the following ways. It serves as a door to the egg, allowing oxygen in and allowing carbon, carbon dioxide to leave. So gas exchange, it is the way that gases are exchanged. The allantois of the amniotic egg functions in directing gases and storing wastes. So basically, as the embryo grows and develops inside of the egg, it's producing wastes. Those wastes are able to uh, leave the area that the embryo is in, and they get stored inside the allantois. Uh, the gases will get directed out through the chorion. Lastly, mammals belong to the group known as the synapsids. So synapsids is a group of reptiles that branched off and gave rise to everything that we know of as a mammal today. We'll talk more about those in our last unit. So amniote eggs. They're eggs with their own food source that are able to protect and feed the de developing young. This is important because now instead of having your embryo hatch fairly early, drop into the water, and have to survive on its own. Now it's got its own food source, its own protection, and it's able to stay independent. Just some of the characteristics we see in amniote eggs, the amnion, uh, the chorion, the allantois, uh, the developing embryo inside of the egg can be seen in this image. Uh, the yolk is the food source that is uh, feeding the growing and developing embryo. Albumin is what we normally think of as egg whites. If you're used to cooking chicken eggs, uh, the egg white is kind of the, the fluid that serves as a cushion, uh, mostly water, but with some other things mixed inside of it. Here's another image of an amniotic egg. You can see the amnion, the chorion, allantois, uh, again, the yolk sac attached to the embryo. Um, through the gut, uh, which is where that food moves from the yolk sac into the embryo. And you can see the connection to the allantois, so waste kind of goes out the other side. Evolution of reptiles. So the reptiles of class reptilia were the first amniotes. So there's three groups of amniotes, uh, reptiles, birds, and mammals, but this group is the first to show up. They have eggs with extra embryonic membranes, that means outside of the embryo, that prevent drying, cushion the embryo, promote gas exchange, and store wastes. This group became dominant in the Mesozoic era, uh, which is sometimes called the age of reptiles. Mesozoic means middle animal, meso, middle, zoic, animal. And what that means is we've got the early animals that show up early in the evolutionary history of the Earth, and then in the middle, we've got this age of reptiles where they kind of become the dominant animal life form. And then we move on and we trans uh, transition next into the Cenozoic, uh, the age of mammals, which we'll get to a little bit later. In birds and reptiles, the amniotic eggs have a hard or leathery covering. Uh, what we see in reptiles generally is the more leathery, soft covering. Uh, birds tend to have the more uh, hard, uh, a brittle may not be the best word to describe it. Uh, they're actually very sturdy and, and able to withstand a lot of uh, damage or pressure, uh, but uh, they tend to be a harder covered egg. And we don't have this in the notes right here, but in the mammals we actually will see that there are some mammals that lay eggs and they actually have kind of a more reptilian leathery covering. Albumin is the fluid that cushions and keeps the embryo moistened, again, mostly water. The yolk is the food stored in the egg for the embryo, so as the embryo is growing and developing, it's got its own little food supply. Reptiles are characterized by what is called one condyle. 
A condyle is a flat surface that allows for muscle attachment and allows articulation of the skull. So how the skull is able to move, uh, it has one flat surface that allows for that muscle attachment. Uh, there are lungs for respiration, kidneys for getting rid of nitrogenous waste, they have internal fertilization, and they have amniotic eggs. So these are all characteristics that we see in reptiles. They also use pretty extensively this protein called keratin. Keratin is used as a protective protein. It's really good at preventing water loss, so it keeps the animal from drying out. And if you use uh, shampoos, sometimes shampoos will have keratin in them. Uh, it is a protein that we actually use. Uh, it's used in our hair, and it can strengthen hair as well. So here is the complete cladogram of amniote, amniote phylogeny, so all of the amniote relatives. Over here on the right, you can see there are synapsids. Uh, synapsids are the, groups, the group that we know as mammals branching off of this uh, ancient reptile ancestor. Then we have over here at the left, we have anapsids, uh, testudines, the turtles. And I mentioned way back when we talked about classification that when we talk about reptiles, it is actually a grouping, a grouping that includes multiple separate groups of animals not every organism that branches off of that ancestor. So mammals are excluded from reptiles. And then we have testudines over here to the right. And then we have the diapsids. Uh, combining anapsids and diapsids is where we get what was mentioned in the video as sarapsidae, uh, the sarapsids or uh, lizards. And in the grouping of diapsids, we have the archosaurs, uh, of which we have uh, crocodilians, uh, the main group that you would know uh, from this, uh, this branch, which is a branch that also includes pterosaurs, which is the winged reptiles. So things like pteranodon, um, the, any of the flying reptiles you would see around the time period of the dinosaurs. Uh, crocodilians have been around since the time of the dinosaurs. And then we have the other grouping, Dinosauria. Notice that these two are not included in Dinosauria. Uh, the dinosaurs include two groups, Ornithischians and Saurischians, which are based on how their hips are put together. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Do they have more bird-like hips or lizard-like hips? Ornithoischia, the ischium is more bird-like, or Saurischian, Saur being lizard, or is it more a lizard hip? And then we have branching off at the end, birds. Notice that there are little cross symbols on here, uh, as in some of the diagrams we've seen before. That means that those are extinct groups. There are no pterosaurs, ornithischians, or saurischians. However, crocodilians representing this branch and uh, aves, which is birds, class aves, are classified as dinosaurs. We'll talk about them more when we get into birds. And then we have the lepidosaurs. Lepidosaurs include ichthyosaurs, these are uh, aquatic reptiles that were around during the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, plesiosaurs, uh, another group of aquatic reptiles that were around. These uh, look a little bit more uh, like crocodilians. They're not crocodilians. They're quite separate uh, by quite a bit. Uh, plesiosaurs would be, if you've ever seen pictures of the Loch Ness Monster, uh, this is the aquatic reptile that lived at the time of the dinosaurs that looked kind of like a lot of people envisioned the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, and then Rhynchocephalia, note this is a group that is, is extant, they are still around, we'll talk about those, and Squamates, we'll talk about that group as well in reptiles. So really the focus of this unit, Testudines, Turtles, uh, Crocodilians, we skip over birds, we will talk about rhynchocephalians, and then we will talk about squamates, which includes uh, lizards and snakes. All right, and next time we will pick up with a little bit more specific information.